Hi everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to Net306 Building Resilient Networks. My name is Carl Tedeschi and I'm a Principal Solutions Architect at AWS based out of Los Angeles. Before AWS, I was a network engineer for 10 years. And as a network engineer, I always deployed networks uh, with a lot of redundancy. So any times I deployed a router or a switch, I will deploy them in pairs. And every time that I would go between network layers, I would always make sure there were at least two physical network connections. Now, when I transitioned to an AWS solutions architect, I had to change how I think a little bit because you're no longer dealing with a physical network. So the purpose of this session today is to help you build networks resiliently on AWS. And I'd like to introduce my partner today, Scott Morrison. Yeah, good morning, everyone. My name's Scott Morrison. I'm a networking specialist, solutions architect at AWS. So I cover all things AWS networking. And one of the most common topics that I talk to my customers about is network resilience. Now, if you've been on AWS for any amount of time, you realize that networking on AWS is a behemoth. There's a lot of different services. There's a lot of different features. And in an hour, we just can't cover all of that. So Kyle and I have picked out some of the most important topics within AWS networking to build your res networks resiliently. And that's what we're gonna try and hit on today. We'll be starting off with some resilience theory, how to kind of think about resilience on AWS from an abstract level. We'll dive into some single region resilience, some multi-region resilience, and then wrap it up with hybrid network resilience, talking about managing networks that extend beyond AWS. If you've been on AWS for any amount of time, you've probably seen this kind of picture. It's the shared responsibility model. You may have seen it for security. You may have seen it for sustainability but we also have it for resilience. And what it essentially says is that at AWS, we're responsible for the resilience of the underlying infrastructure. We make sure our network's highly available, we make sure our services are highly available, and we make sure that our regions are highly available. And we'll talk about those different fault isolation zones in there, which is where it extends into your hands as the customer. You're responsible for making sure that you architect yourself to take advantage of these fault isolation zones, that you're able to sustain failures, and that you can build resilience on your application. And that's where you sit on the responsibility model, and that's why it's a shared responsibility model. When we think about resilience in AWS, the first thing we think of is the fact that there's trade-offs. You can't have everything that you want. It's just the unfortunate part of life, right? And when we think of distributed systems, which is what most people build on AWS, the way that applies is a theory called CAP theorem. For those of you who may have studied computer science, you may have heard this before, but for those that may not have heard of this before, CAP theorem is an acronym, stands for consistency, availability, and ability to withstand partitioning. What it says is that within this triad, you can really only have two. So you can be very consistent and very available, but if there's a partitioning event, you may fall over, right? You can be very consistent and handle partitioning, but have a little less availability. But the fact of the matter is, is you don't just get two. You get to trade off, and so as you can see in the middle area there, while you can't be in the dead center, you can skirt around it. And so as you design your applications and your networks in AWS, you have to think about cap theorem. And think about out of these three, which one's most important to you, which one's second most important, and which one's third. And design your trade-offs for that, right? The other thing we have to consider when we're talking about designing resilient workloads is understanding the cost and complexity with the different levels of resilience. You may tier your workloads into things like dev and non-prod, production non-critical, mission critical. Dev and non-prod environments, you may have very little redundancy, you may have no redundancy, and that's okay. 
because if these go down, they don't affect your customers. But maybe you still need some resilience because if it goes down, your developers aren't working, right? And that's costing your company money. Within production, we start to get more, right? We need more resilience. We need to make sure that the end customer is able to use the platform. But maybe these things aren't mission critical. If it goes down for 30 minutes, it's fine. And so the trade-off there is we're going to spend a little bit more money. It's going to be moderately complex, but it's not going to be too extreme. And we're still going to get you know, a decent amount of availability. Then we have those mission critical workloads. Those can be things like IDLS systems, immediate danger to life safety, right? So 911 systems, um, things like healthcare systems that may do patient telemetry, other things like that. That's where you really want to tear out and go maximum resilience. It's going to cost you a lot more. It's going to be a lot more complex. But that's where it's worth investing. But if you go take your dev workload and invest in that, you're probably just wasting money and complexity, right? And we don't want to do that. So we don't want to go overkill on those lower environments, but we don't want to underdo it on those more mission critical environments. Now, I told you a little bit about failure domains. And then within AWS, we have a couple different types of failure domains. The first question I usually get is, is AWS a failure domain? The answer is no, AWS is not. And the reason that AWS in and of itself is not a failure domain is because we operate our regions completely independently of one another. We have very few global services, and those services operate at very high availability. So when you look at things like Route 53, you'll see an extremely high availability SLA on Route 53. That's because it's global service. It uses the data plane and multiple regions to make sure that we can always respond to DNS queries. But most services exist from the regions. And that's where our first fault domain is. Now, regions don't fail a whole lot. It's very, very rare. But they are a fault domain. And so this is going multi-region is one of those things that's very cost intensive and very complex. So you have to be very considerate of, do you really need multi-region? Or do you just need to be able to redeploy in another region in case something goes really, really haywire, right? But where you really need to start looking at fault isolation zones is availability zones. Every region we have has multiple availability zones, usually three or more. And these availability zones operate independent from one another. So when we take a look at services like NAT Gateway, NAT Gateway operates in independent availability zones. You deploy one per availability zone, the control plane's isolated, the data plane's isolated. It's completely isolated to that availability zone. Network load balancer, on the other hand, you deploy to both, right? From a control plane perspective, when you deploy a network load balancer, you have a regional object, right, that spans multiple availability zones. But in each availability zone are individual nodes, and these nodes are independent of one another. They operate at a zonal isolation. So with Network Load Balancer, the data plane, the thing that handles the packets, is an availability zone fault domain, but the control plane is regional. So you have to be a little careful with how you make changes to your Network Load Balancer because you can affect multiple zones at the same time. And so I encourage you to think through your applications and your networks and put them into these fault domains, right? Understand where's the fault domain on each of these individual components? Is it regional? Is it zonal? Is it something below a zone, like a you know, cell, right? Think through that. One of the other failure domains that I notice a lot of people don't think about is flows. In AWS networking, a flow is a five tuple for TCP and UDP. That's the source and destination port, source and destination uh, IP address, and the IANA protocol number. For all other protocols that are not TCP and UDP, it's three tuple, source and test IP, and IANA protocol number. That defines a flow. So thinking TCP, TCP session is a flow, right? When we take a look at our physical network, 
We have multiple routers. It's still just the same physical network that you would think on-prem. And when we take three flows, they may go across three paths. Now, there's no guarantee that all three flows are going to go different paths, but they have a better chance of being spread out. So the more flows and the more spread out, you're going to be on the physical network. This means that when you take these three flows and they go on different paths, they don't share the same fate. So congestion, link failure, those kind of things aren't going to affect all three flows. They may affect just a subset of them. To do this, you can use SRD, which is Scalable Reliable Datagram. And that's the QR code down there if you want to grab a scan of that. Uh, it's a protocol that we've developed at AWS. I mean, in fact, we released this week ENA Express, which is running on top of SRD. When we take those flows and we isolate them into a single flow, they now have a shared fate. And so if that link dies, all three of those flows are going to die, right? Where this is most important is encapsulation and overlays. When we encapsulate, we take all those three flows and condense them down into one flow, and that's very dangerous. So be careful with doing encapsulation protocols because now everything's taking the same physical path. The next thing to think about is data plane versus control plane. Data plane is the main function of the service. It handles packets, it handles uh, requests, those kind of things. It's the actual main function. Versus control plane is how you manage the service, configure it, those kind of things. When we look at Route 53, we have changed resource record sets. That's part of the control plane. We also have a Route 53 health check. That's part of the data plane. When you're instantiating failover, you want to make sure that you're using the data plane, not the control plane. Because the data plane is implemented to be highly redundant, the control plane is implemented to be highly consistent, right? So if we go back to CAP theorem, control plane consistent, data plane available, right? Transit gateway, we have replaced transit gateway route, and we have border gateway protocol, BGP. BGP, part of the data plane. Replace transit gateway route, that's part of the control plane. So we wanna make sure not to use the control plane, but to use the data plane instead. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Kyle to talk about some single region resilient concepts. Kyle? Great, thank you, Scott. So single region resilience. In this section, we're going to take a look at how to build a network within a single region in a highly resilient manner. We're going to cover services such as NAT gateway, transit gateway, and load balancing. So first, I want to talk about AWS Hyperplane. So AWS Hyperplane is an internal service. You may be wondering why I'm talking to you about an internal service today. The reason I'm talking about this internal service is because it underpins many of the AWS services that you use today. So AWS Hyperplane is a horizontally scalable state management uh, for the network. It provides terabits of multi-tenant capacity and supports the services you see on screen right now. So NAT gateway, private link, NOAA load balancer, and more. So Hyperplane has multiple nodes that are fault tolerant and highly available within an AZ. So when you create an attachment, this attachment goes on a set of these Hyperplane nodes within an AZ. Now this is highly available. You could have uh, one of those Hyperplane nodes go unhealthy and that would only impact a subset of traffic going through that interface. And what we do is then we migrate that traffic over to a healthy uh, Hyperplane node. When you create another attachment, let's say in another VPC, it's going to use another set of hyperplane nodes. So this is known as shuffle sharding. So as you can see, hyperplane is a multi-tenant service. Uh, with hyperplane, uh, you also see that there is some overlap. So for example, attachments in VPC A and VPC B are also active on some uh, overlapping hyperplane nodes. As you sort of build out your service to the entire region, this is what it looks like once you drop attachments in to those other AZs. 
So this is highly recommended to do because Hyperplane is fully fault tolerant and highly available within an AZ. And to get a resilience within the region, it's highly recommended to put attachments into those multiple AZs. So moving on to NAT gateway. Let's take a look at what AWS's responsibility for resilience is the shared, in the shared responsibility model. So NAT Gateway is managed by AWS. This means that AWS operates the infrastructure layer, the operating system, and the platform, and customers only have to worry about sending traffic to that endpoint. NAT Gateway is implemented with redundancy within the availability zone, and you'll see what I mean by that. So what is the customer's responsibility for resilience in the shared responsibility model? Let's take a look at this example scenario. Here, we've got a VPC with three availability zones. And we've got EC2 instances in an auto-scaling group for resilience. We're going to go deploy a NAT gateway because these EC2 instances in the private subnets want, need uh, internet access. Let's say we go and put one NAT gateway in an AZ. What happens if something in that AZ becomes unhealthy and impacts uh, that NAT gateway? What happens is, is all the EC2 instances that rely on that NAT gateway now are unable to get internet access. So what we recommend here is to deploy NAT gateways into each availability zone that you are active in. Now what do I mean by each availability zone you are active in? It is one with where you have resources deployed. So yes, a region may have like four AZs, but you may only be using three of them. So please put uh, NAT gateways in each of those three AZs that you are active in. And on top of that, the, sub, the subnet route table should be updated to use the local NAT gateway. Therefore, what it looks like now is if you have an unhealthy event occurring in, let's say, AZ A, only EC2 instances in that AZ are going to be impacted by that event and not have internet access, whereas the instances in the other AZs are going to be able to use their local NAT gateways that are not impacted. Because don't forget, NAT gateways are highly available within the availability zone and completely isolated between AZs. OK, Transit Gateway. So once again, Transit Gateway is managed by AWS, which means we look after the operating system, the infrastructure, and the platform. You only have to worry about configuring it and setting, sending traffic to the endpoints. Transit Gateway is implemented with redundancy within the region. So for a customer, what are your responsibilities in the uh, shared responsibility model? Let's take a look at this sample scenario. So here, we've got a VPC with three AZs. And we've got some EC2 instances that, let's say, need to access an application that is in another VPC. So we want to do some inter-VPC routing here. What we do is we want to deploy a transit gateway. When we configure a transit gateway, we need to deploy, well, we need to drop attachments into subnets. So what we do is we don't just put attachment into one AZ, we put an attachment into each AZ that we are active in. So what this does is it provides, similar to like with NAT Gateway, what it provides is it gives you access so that if any unhealthy event happens in a specific AZ, resources in the other AZs are still able to access Transit Gateway without any issues because they're using their local attachment. One question that we get a lot is, uh, should I deploy multiple Transit Gateways for resilience? And the simple answer is no. And the reason is, is because Transit Gateway is built upon Hyperplane. And I went through sort of in a previous uh, slide of what Hyperplane is. So it's fault tolerant, highly available within an AZ, and that sort of um, ends up being you know, highly fault tolerant and reliable within a region. So when you saw that the shuffle sharding that's going on, there is no need to deploy multiple Transit Gateways for data plane resilience. You'll get it through that uh, single transit gateway that you deploy. Application load balancer. So application load balancer is managed by AWS and implemented with redundancy within the region. And when you create an ALB, AWS goes and creates a, 
a DNS name for you, and that DNS name is managed. And the reason that it's managed is because you'll see that there's ALB nodes that are created, and AWS manages to make sure that only healthy nodes are going to be served in DNS. So what do you need to do with on the customer side? Let's say you've got a VPC with two availability zones and some targets in there. You go deploy an ALB because you want to load balance some web traffic, some HTTP or HTTPS traffic. And what we'll do is we'll go deploy uh, some ALB nodes into the subnet that you specify. So in this scenario, you've gone, I want it in a subnet in both AZA and AZB, as you can see on the screen there. So let's say you've got some clients that now want to access this application. What they're going to do is they're going to go do a DNS query for your domain, example.com. And Amazon Route 53 is going to respond with the, a list of IPs of the ALB nodes uh, for your application load balancer. The client is then going to pick one of these, usually the first one that it gets, and then it's going to send its packet over to ALB. And then you can see that node is going to forward it over to the targets. Now, how does resilience work here? So what happens is Route 53 is doing health checks on those ALB nodes. And if it detects an unhealthy node, it's going to stop responding to DNS queries with that IP address. And then what's going to happen is the ALB service, which is managed for you, is going up. The ALB service is basically going to take down the unhealthy node and spin up a new healthy node. And once that healthy node is online, it's going to be available in DNS. Network load balancer. Let's take a look at what AWS responsibility is in the shared responsibility model for resilience. So a network load balancer is managed by AWS, is implemented with redundancy within the availability zone. And we'll have a look in a minute in a diagram of what I mean by that. And then DNS records in Route 53 are used to provide redundancy within the region. Let's take a look at a scenario. So we've got a VPC with two AZs, and we've got some targets of like some non-HTTP traffic, because now we're low balancers layer four uh, low balancer, it doesn't have to be HTTP traffic like ALB. Uh, so we go and deploy a network load balancer to do some load balancing. And when you go to configure that network load balancer, it will ask you where do you want to put your, your NLB? What subnets? And so what's happening is the subnets that you specify, some ENIs are going to be dropped in there that's going to be for NLB. But NLB uses hyperplane. So what happens is, is there will be a single ENI with a single IP address in that subnet that you specify, but is backed by hyperplane, which has multiple nodes serving the traffic for you. This is really what allows you uh, to use static IP addresses with uh, NLB for an AZ. So what happens here in this example is if there is an unhealthy NLB node, that's essentially an unhealthy hyperplane node, that's going to be transparently, traffic's going to be transparently moved off it onto another node without you knowing. And the IP address is not going to change because that single IP address is served by multiple hyperplane nodes. So let's go through a scenario where we've got a client that wants to connect to your NLB. They're going to do a query to Route 53. Let's say example.com. Route 53 is going to respond with some IP addresses that represent those ENIs in the subnets that you specified. The client is then going to go and connect to those ENIs, and then the traffic is going to be forwarded. So you can see here, Route 53 is still going to be doing health checks for you, making sure that these NLB ENIs are up and available. And what happens is, is if there's something, some event that causes availab an availability zone, let's say AZA, to go unhealthy, Route 53 is going to detect that in the health checks and then no longer serve that IP address for the impacted AZ. And so the healthy AZ will be the one that gets all that traffic. So sort of that's how redundancy works between the AZs in a region with NLB. Let's take a look at Gateway Load Balancer. So Gateway Load Balancer is used for third-party appliance traffic inspection. It is also, uh, AWS Network Firewall also uses Gateway Load Balancer in the background um, itself. 
So sort of when I talk about gateway load balancer, I'm also sort of talking about network firewall, or how traffic gets to network firewall. So a gateway load balancer is managed by AWS. So the operating system, infrastructure, platform is all managed for you. And it's implemented with redundancy in the availability zone. Let's take a look at a, a scenario here. So here we've got a VPC within, that has two AZs. And what we want to do is we're deploying some third-party firewalls that we want to inspect our traffic with. So how do we get traffic? You know, how do we do this inspection? So what we do is we go ahead and we create and configure a gateway load balancer. And when you create a gateway load balancer, it asks you where do you want to drop the attachments or where do you want to drop the ENIs into? What subnets? You go ahead and do that. Similar to NLB, is those ENIs are not like nodes. They're essentially hyperplane, backed by hyperplane. So each ENI has a set of hyperplane nodes that support it and help it function. This is how we get redundancy and resilience within an AZ, is there is no single point of failure uh, for, for gateway load balancer. Now, the diff main difference with gateway load balancer compared to NLB is with how the traffic ends up at the appliance. So traffic is encapsulated in the Geneve tunnel, and this is how basically we can do inline inspection. So moving on to the customer's responsibility in the shared responsibility model, one of the questions that we get all the time is, should I enable cross-zone loan balancing? Before I answer that question, let's take a look at a scenario just to make sure we're all on the same page of what is cross-zone load balancing. So here we've got a VPC with two availability zones and a target group in each. And that target group is fronted by elastic load balancer. It could be NLB, it could be ALB. Uh, we've got a set of clients out there. These clients are tr trying to access our service, so they do a DNS query to example.com. And Ralph 53 responds back with a list of IP addresses for our load balancer nodes. Traffic is then load shared between those two availability zones through the ALB, through to the target group. What happens now if cross-load load balancing is disabled and we've got an unhealthy target group in AZA? What's essentially going to happen is Rapid3 is performing health checks to those two load balancer nodes or ENIs, and it's going to detect that AZA in this scenario is not healthy anymore. And Route 53 is going to stop responding to clients with the IP address of the AZA node. And clients are going to be sitting there. They're going to wait for their, uh, you know, if clients that are using AZA, they're going to still keep trying to use AZA until their time to live is expired, which is set to 60 seconds for ELB nodes. And after that, and the Route 53 health checks detect it, so up to around 90 seconds, then once the client requeries, is going to be able to access the healthy, uh, he healthy sort of stack that's in AZB. Now, if you had cross-zone load balancing enabled, what happens is the ELB itself is performing health checks every 50 seconds to your target groups. So here, it can actually do that failover for you, and Route 53 health checks won't have to do any failover. You can do it at the ELB. So, should I enable cross-load load balancing? Now, it depends. Uh, with application and network load balancers, the recommendation is disabled when using AZs as fault, toler as fault domains. So sort of as Scott was talking about earlier, the fault domains, like what do you view as a fault domain? It really depends on your application architecture. Some customers view an entire region as a fault domain. So you've got services, you've got servers and um, you know, compute basically spread across all AZs and traffic jumps between AZs and it's all, it's all one. Uh, whereas some customers build each AZ as a separate, dedicated, isolated fault domain. And that is generally, when we think about resilience, that's sort of what we want to get to, is we want to treat each AZ as its own dedicated, isolated fault domain. So that is why we are saying to disable uh, disable application and network load balancers from you doing cross-load load balancing in those scenarios. 
this is the non-default setting, so it is something that you have to change. But what it allows you to do is, if you view it in this world of a separate fault domain, is now your elastic load balancing is a part of that fault domain. If anything happens in that AZ, you're going to rely on DNS to basically switch all the traffic over into a different AZ. So you've got 100% no traffic going into the unhealthy uh, application stack in the un yeah, in the un to the unhealthy application stack AZ. When we're turning off cross-load load balancing, you do need to ensure that you know, you, you've got targets that are available and that the targets in that AZ can handle the load. To ensure this, you can configure the min health targets attribute to make sure that the AZ has enough capacity to handle the load that's coming through. Now, what about gateway load balancer? The recommendation with gateway load balancer is usually to enable cross-load load balancing, which is the non-default setting. And the reason for that is potentially it could be less cost to do that. The reason I say it's less cost is because if you think about it, it is less, uh, if you're paying licensing for this third-party network inspection appliance, uh, if you have cross-load load balancing enabled, you can have one appliance in each AZ and do it that way. So you're paying the license for two nodes. Whereas if you disable cross-load load balancing, to build a highly resilient architecture that way, you're going to need two appliances in each AZ so that you don't end up black, black uh, holding traffic. So in that case, where, you know, potentially it's a cost thing between two appliances and four appliances. So really it's a, it's a licensing decision there. Some other best practices with ELB. Use and respect DNS. So please don't rely on any static IP addresses. Use and respect DNS. Route 53 is going to manage those domain uh, names for you, the DNS names for you that it configures. It's going to stop serving something that goes unhealthy. Uh, and clients, on the other hand, should also respect uh, time to live there. It is also recommended to use exponential backoff and jitter when reconnecting. And the reason for that is when you fail over, you don't really want to overwhelm your application. It's going to get overwhelmed with all those connections coming through. And as it retries, you don't want to have a retry storm. So you want to implement those exponential backoff and jitter. So let's take a look at what I've talked about so far, a recommended architecture for a single uh, region with three AZs. So on the far left, AZA, you see multiple services that I've spoken about today. And they're all only active in one AZ at the moment. So the best practices that I went through are deploy NAT gateways into each AZ you are active in. Deploy private links in each AZ that you're active in. Now, I didn't go into private link, but high, uh, private link is also backed by AWS Hyperplane, so it's highly available fault tolerant in that way. And it's the same recommendation as to NAT gateway to deploy it into each active AZ. Transit gateway attachments should be deployed into each active AZ. And so should any AWS network firewall endpoints or gateway load balancer endpoints. And also went through some best practices when it comes to load balancing regarding uh, should you enable or disable cross-load load balancing and some DNS best practices. Alrighty, let's move over to multi-region resilience. So for many applications, deploying into multiple availability zones in a single region and aligning with the AWS Well Architecture Framework offers the right balance of availability, simplicity, and affordability. However, some customers have regulatory or other, regions, or other reasons to require a multi-region architecture. So in this section, I'm going to talk about inter-region inter routing, so how do you get to VPCs between uh, regions in a highly resilient fashion. And also, we're going to explore three options on how to get traffic to multi-region architectures. So that's, let's say you've got uh, application stacks in multiple regions that you want to be uh, running to. So I'll have a look at some traffic routing options uh, for that scenario. So first, inter-region connectivity. The first thing you can use is VPC peering. So VPC peering is a way to get a network connectivity between two VPCs in different regions, or even within the same region. 
And with VPC peering, resilience is built in for you. There is nothing at all that you need to do to get more resilience out of VPC peering. You don't need to create multiple of them. You don't need redundancy. All of that is handled by AWS for you. You just need to configure that VPC peer. Now, what about Transit Gateway? So we saw how Transit Gateway is built with resilience within a region. But with Transit Gateway, once you talk about multi-regions, you only need to configure peering connections between the Transit Gateways that you want to peer with. Now, you don't need to create redundancy there. You don't need to create multiple peering uh, connections. There is no need for that. And the reason is, it's because a peering connection is just as resilient as a Transit Gateway in that region. All of the high availability, high availability stuff is managed for you by AWS. Now, what about Cloud WAN? Now, Cloud WAN is a service that customers use to connect VPCs together and create sort of a global network on AWS, the VPCs and on-prem uh, networks. Now, resilience is built in to Cloud WAN. However, when we talk to customers about Cloud WAN, we do get questions about, do we need to deploy a transit gateway to back up my Cloud WAN in case something happens with Cloud WAN? And the answer to that is no, you don't need to do that. Cloud WAN is as resilient as Transit Gateway is in a region. So there is no need to do any additional redundancy uh, for using Cloud WAN. Let's take a look at those traffic routing options that I mentioned about how to get traffic within multiple uh, regions. I want to bring up this diagram here. So this diagram, you can see that we've got AWS Cloud and we've got an application stack in two separate regions fronted by an elastic load balancer in the region. In a scenario, let's say if we're using Route 53 as our traffic routing option, we're gonna have a set of clients up there, and they're going to do a DNS query to our domain name example.com. And then Route 53 is configured to either return region A's load balancer IPs or region B's load balancer IPs. So you can configure the traffic routing options in Route 53. You can do weighted, you can do round robin, you can do latency based, you can do loca um, geolocation based. All the support of Route 53 options are there to route traffic to your regions. Now with Route 53, Route 53 is resilient, has a resilient control and data plane. And as Scott was talking about earlier, the data plane is globally distributed and the control plane is located in US East 1. So this is why we generally make the recommendation that when you want to perform traffic switching between region A or region B, or taking an unhealthy uh, application stack in a region offline, that we recommend to use the data plane. And by using the data plane, what we mean is to use either health check, rather through health checks, or ARC, or application recovery controller. Uh, many customers today, um, we have seen customers today use uh, like an AWS API to perform this uh, failover. Uh, just something to keep in mind is it, the API call that Scott went, uh, went through earlier does rely on the control plane, whereas using the data plane for failover or for traffic routing is uh, you're using that globally distributed uh, network of services to, to achieve that. So the recommendation here is Route 53 health checks for active active architectures. And if you want to have more control or some like additional checks before you perform a failover, like maybe a DR scenario, I recommend you check out Application Recovery Controller or ARC. And um, yeah, so on the page there, there is a QR code of a really good blog post that goes into much more detail about uh, Route 53 health checks and ARC and when to use what. I'll leave that on page for a moment while some photos are taken. Oh, sorry, we'll take questions at the end. Okay, routing option number two, CloudFront. So CloudFront has a presence in over 400 edge locations around the world, and is in it, it's a service intended for web traffic. So it's a content delivery network for web traffic. Let's take a look at a, a scenario here. So let's say our origin source, our origin for our um, content, is in two regions, region A and region B. We go ahead and we can configure CloudFront. And when CloudFront has two locations, it's got the edge location um, as well as uh, regional edge caches located around the world. So in an example scenario, let's say we've got a set of clients that's accessing our application. 
These clients are going to perform a DNS query, and they're going to end up connecting to a, a CloudFront Edge location. Now, this Edge location is either going to respond back with the content the client's after, if it's locally cached, or it's going to forward the request over to a regional Edge cache. Now, similar thing over here. The regional Edge cache has either got the content locally cached, and it's going to respond back to the client with it, or it needs to make a connection back to the origin. And this connection back to the origin is now where we talk about your, your multi-region um, deployment. So in this scenario, what you can do is you can rely on Route 53 for this origin connectivity. So let's say, for example, region, uh, you've got a DNS name, origin.example.com. Uh, now your origin is backed by region a.example.com and region b.example.com. And Route 53, depending on what address Route 53 returns with, is going to be the, uh, the node or the area, or oh, sorry, the region that the CloudFront is going to forward that traffic to. So for example, if that CloudFront regional edge cache node got uh, the response from Route 53 that the origin was in region A, it's going to forward the traffic to region A. Now, if one of those application stacks in one of those regions became unhealthy, what's going to happen is Route 53 is no longer going to serve that unhealthy region uh, to DNS queries. And therefore, uh, when CloudFront goes and performs that DNS query, it's going to get the IP address of the healthy region. And that's going to be your healthy origin there. And what about our third option? Our third option is to use AWS Global Accelerator. Now, AWS Global Accelerator is great uh, in the sense that it supports TCP and UDP uh, traffic, including non-HTTP traffic. Now, it doesn't do caching like uh, CloudFront, but it does support those non-HTTP uh, workloads. So uh, Global Accelerator has a presence in over 90 edge locations around the world. Let's take a look at a sample uh, scenario here. So we've got two regions, an application stack available in two regions, similar as before. But now we're going to go ahead and we're going to deploy Global Accelerator. When we go and create a Global Accelerator, what happens is you're given an Anycast IP address that's in a point of a global class any, you're going to be given a global Anycast IP address. You're going to give them two of them, and they're going to be in isolated network zones. So you'll see that each Anycast IP address is owned by a separate network zone. So this is how we get that, the redundancy to get you resilience here. Uh, what this sort of looks like from a client standpoint, we've got a client, it's going to connect to example.com, and Route 53 is either going to respond with, it's going to respond with both IP addresses, really, depending how you configure Route 53. But what this allows you to do is Route 53 is going to give you the high availability for your network zones. So if one of the network zones goes unhealthy, Route 53 is going to detect that and only serve traffic to the healthy network zone. So let's say in this scenario, the client chose the top of the IP address and it was network zone one, and then Global Accelerator is going to forward the traffic to the origin. Now how does Global Accelerator forward traffic to the origin? It depends on the routing policy that you've got in Global Accelerator. But one thing to keep in mind here is Global Accelerator is doing health checks to the origin itself. So you can usually get failover in about 30 seconds between origins using Global Accelerator. So just to recap here, there's two things going on. For high availability for the actual Global Accelerator Anycast IP address, the network zone, we're using Route 53 for that and health checks. For your actual origin application stack, whether it's healthy or not, Global Accelerator is performing the health checks. All righty, thank you. And now I'm going to hand back to Scott to wrap up with hybrid network resilience. Thanks, Carl. So yeah, let's uh, talk about some hybrid network resilience. When we look at hybrid networks, the first thing that we talk about usually is Direct Connect. Direct Connect allows you to connect directly to AWS using dedicated fiber and take the shortest path into your AWS region and your private VPCs. 
When we look at Direct Connect, we have two real resilient models. We have a high resilience model and a maximum resilience model. And you can find these on the Direct Connect main page uh, online. So we do show these recommendations there. When you look at these three architectures on the screen here, taking a look at the one on the left there, that's the high resilience model. It is not the maximum resilience. And the reason it's a high resilience model is we have one connection per location in two different locations. So this is high resilience. It's good for uh, those kind of um, production workloads, but they're not mission critical ones, right? Then we take a look at this middle one and we go, well, that looks kind of like maximum resilience, but it's not. And the reason that it's not is to be in our maximum resilience model, you need to be in two direct connect locations. You need to have two connections on different logical devices in those uh, locations. And one of those locations needs to be associated to the same region that your workload is running in that you're trying to connect to. So that leads us from the one on the right, which fits all of that criteria. Now, when we look at this architecture, a lot of people say, well, Scott, you have a single direct connect gateway there. It's a single point of failure, right? And so they ask, should we add a backup direct connect gateway? The answer is no. Direct connect gateway is not a single point of failure. Uh, it's not even part of the routing plane. Packets don't go through it. It's a big kind of logical route reflector and it allows uh, your data to transfer on the shortest path on MediaBus backbone back to the region. It actually scales and become more, becomes more resilient the more connections you add in different locations throughout the uh, globe. And it actually helps simplify that multi-location, multi-region architecture to help you get to that more resilient standpoint. So you only need one. Keep it simple. Adding two is not going to add any value to you. Um, it's just going to make things more complicated. The next thing that we kind of talked about is how long does it take to fail over between virtual interfaces? If you're using multiple direct connect gateways, this can become very long. But when you're on a single direct connect gateway, we're using BGP convergence to fail over. And so we take a look at our link here, and we have our established link between on-prem and our direct connect gateway. We have the eBGP session going. And eBGP uh, timers can go as low as 90 seconds. 90 seconds isn't super great for really critical workloads, right? That's where bidirectional forwarding detection comes in. I see so many customers forget about this. We support BFD, and with BFD, we continuously send hello packets back and forth. And we support up to 300 milliseconds uh, variance in those packets, right? So that you can send a packet every 300 milliseconds. And you have to miss three before we consider it down. This means in less than one second, so 900 milliseconds, we can detect a link failure and instantiate that failover. It's very quick. But what about site-to-site -site VPN? In site-to-site -site VPN, you get two tunnels for every connection. You're not paying anything more to use a second tunnel. I see a lot of customers go, well, if I use a second tunnel, it's gonna cost me more, right? No, it doesn't, you're already paying for it. We use that so that we can fail over between the tunnels. We suggest you use BGP in there, not static routing. That way we can um, instantiate the uh, shift of traffic from one tunnel to the other when we do maintenance. We use MED, multi-exit discriminator, to influence that traffic. Also, if a tunnel fails, you just have BGP convergence, you're going back to those timers, so it's about 90 seconds. We don't support bidirectional forwarding detection on site-to-site -site VPN, only on Direct Connect. Um, when you're connecting to multiple regions, we suggest that you connect directly to those regions. I see a lot of customers take a connection to, say, US East 1, go across a transit gateway pier or across CloudWAN to US West 2, and does that work? Yes. The problem is if there's an issue in US East 1, you've now affected US West 2. You've crossed those fault boundaries, right? And so if you connect to both those regions you're in, creating this crossover connection that I can show here, you're isolating those boundaries. So if one region fails for some reason, it's not gonna affect the other. If one of those customer router fails, it's not gonna affect the other. 
The other thing to consider in hybrid workloads, but this is really true of any networking, is baseline. Baseline and monitor. Go turn on flow logs. See what your top talkers are. Should you keep them on all the time for every traffic? Depends on your model, but usually probably not. It gets a little expensive if you're doing a lot of flows. Uh, if you need it for compliance reasons, you know, definitely do it. Um, but turn it on to get an idea, right? Let's put it on for a week, see what your top talkers are, see what your average amount of traffic is and where it's going. Get those CloudWatch metrics. You can use uh, the Amazon VPC debugging tool. Uh, just search it on your favorite search engine. Um, there's a blog on it, and it's basically spinning up an EC2 instance that uses uh, MTR, my trace route, um, to get latency jitter, packet loss, and log it in CloudWatch metrics. You can also kind of baseline what your bandwidth is and what your average latency is, right? Understanding that's very helpful because when you go into an investigation, you go, my application's running slow, you go, cool, it's 100 milliseconds. Well, was it 100 milliseconds yesterday or was it 10 milliseconds yesterday? If it's 10 milliseconds, we got a network problem. If it's 100 milliseconds all the time, probably not a network issue, right? So take a look at those things, baseline them. Run end-to-end -end tests, things like IPSLA, right? And that's where that debugging tool comes into play. That way you understand what your traffic looks like, you understand what your user experience is. These are all very good things to have in your back pocket when you're trying to do that troubleshooting. So just wrapping up, when we talk about hybrid network resilience, Direct Connect, we're gonna be in two locations. We wanna make sure that uh, one of those locations is associated with the same region that our workload's in. For maximum resilience, we wanna make sure we have two connections in each of those locations. And there are different logical device IDs. Do be careful, there's logical device ID and then there's just device ID. You wanna make sure you're on different logical device IDs. You wanna make sure you've enabled BFD and that you don't have multiple direct connect gateways. There's no need, it's just creating complexity. On site to site VPN, you wanna make sure that you're using both tunnels, use dynamic routing. You can also use ECMP to aggregate bandwidth and kind of create an active active. Just be aware you're gonna end up with asymmetric routing, so make sure your uh, customer premise equipment supports that. You can also use Global Accelerator with site to site VPN by enabling accelerated site to site VPN. This will bring you onto our backbone faster and help you kind of avoid internet weather. With that, we have just a few minutes left. But before we go to questions, uh, I do wanna do a shout out and say there is a feedback survey I know you get this from everybody, but please do fill it out. It actually does add value to us to understand what your experience is, what we can do better, what you did like. Um, so please take just a few minutes to fill it out. If anybody has any questions, there's two mics here in the center of the room, so feel free to hop up there. And if you don't get a chance to uh, get your question asked during this, uh, we'll also be outside right after. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>